uh, the hadith regarding uh, rada regarding um, uh, the specific qualities as well of, of like the milk and the effects of it is the hadith of Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala an in Sunnah bi Dawood la yahrumu min ar-rada illa ma anbata al-lahma wa anshaza al-'azma that no breastfeeding prohibits except that which grows the the the, the, the meat of a child and strengthens the bones of a child and so the, this is the milk that the child feeds on and so that happens under the age of two as for if the child does not need it and he's just drinking it as, as a result of almost like having almost like a supplementary meal then that no longer uh, this bond does not really apply and obviously that happens after the age of two and also you have to consider uh, the number uh, we move on to the last hadith regarding a rada'ah which is um, where, and this is where this topic again of, that we covered previously in the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, remember that man I was seated with her, that she thought was um, her brother. And this happens time and time again as a result of people not documenting these sort of bonds as well, who breastfed who. And so this hadith is the hadith of Uqbah ibn al-Harith. أنه تزوج أمي يحيى بنت أبي إهاب فجاءت أمة سوداء فقالت قد أرضعتكما فذكر فذكرت ذلك للنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال فأعرض قال فأعرض أو فأعرض عني قال فتنحيت فذكرت ذلك له فقال وكيف قد زعم وقد زعمت أن قد أرضعتكما and so in this hadith, the hadith of Uqbah ibn al-Harith, he mentions that he, mar- he married a daughter of Ibn Abi Ihab, uh, Umm Yahya. And so whilst they were married, and again, they aren't aware of their relationship between each other, uh, a, a slave girl, a black slave girl comes along and she basically says that I breastfed both of you. You've just got married, you're, you're together, I've breastfed both of you. So I am, you're both of your milk mothers, which would make them brothers and sisters. And so this was mentioned by, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Uqba mentioned this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam turned away. And then the Uqba comes again and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and how? Whilst she has claimed that meaning, that that's it. You know, you're no longer, how are you still married? And so in this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rebukes the questioning of, of Uqba regarding this specific matter because once the woman has claimed that they, she, she's breastfed both of these individuals, that's it. You've become aware that you're now brothers and sisters. There is no marriage there. And this is obviously what went before would be anikah shubha would be a form of like a doubtful marriage would be rendered invalid at the point of them acquiring knowledge that they are actually brothers and sisters. And obviously there is no marriage between them. And so in fesakh nikah this is one of the reasons why you have fesakh, where their marriage is automatically annulled. Before that they were married because nobody knew of this. But the second that comes to light, the marriage is automatically annulled. Um, uh, uh, what's the hadith? Uh, what's the hadith? What's the hadith? فنهاه عنها لا ما عندي اي ورا بعد دوز اني بدي هاف ذا كوبي اوف عبد الرسول القاسم كيف وقد جاءت بس يا ذاتس ذا زياده هذا عندكم uh, وقد نهى عنها هذا ما عندي بس um, all of this it just strengthens the topic of the prohibition uh, 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 coming about as a result of that issue uh, there is a very important issue here which is that generally speaking a shahada, you require a testimony requires at least two people. And in the context of women, it's even more mu'akkad that you have two people because their one testimony or one testimony of a man in the sharia is equivalent to two of the women. And here you have this exception. And the scholars of Islam discuss whether that's actually an exception or whether this follows the general theme of how testimonies work. And so the theory of testimony in Islam, nadariya shariya towards uh, uh, the Bab al shahada is that it follows ilm al shakhs what the person could have acquired knowledge regarding. And so, for example, in the context of wealth and so on, this is something that, generally speaking, the person engaged in it is a man because that is how trade would work, especially in those days. As for these sort of issues, then it's really only women. This is only women, and so her shahada sufficed. Her shahada uh, uh, sufficed, and so she claimed that. 
she didn't need somebody else to agree with that even though again look at everything that you have in this hadith she was a slave as well which would have reduced the status of that testimony as well but again just because that is is there automatically the 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 the, the, the bond is affirmed the bond of them being brothers and sisters and uh, the marriage is automatically annulled the marriage is automatically annulled the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also rebuked him in this hadith because of his attempt to try and remain with her even though the, there is a lot of questions with regards to this and you can see that her testimony there is a lot that you can ask regarding and uh, the prophet sallallahu rejected all of that and automatically took the position that that marriage is automatically null and void and that uh, uh, that automatically you affirm the topic of her being her that they're being related by way of breastfeeding shahadatu Thubut al radah is a topic of disagreement amongst the scholars of Islam. This wording, as you can see, is in Sahih al-Bukhari. And the scholars of Islam do have a difference of opinion uh, regarding that. Um, and so, for example, the views of Imam al-Shafi'i and the method of al-Shafi'i is uh, two men, four women. And in the case of a slave girl, it would even break down even more. So it's almost like this hadith, they don't even apply it entirely. Uh, um, the Hanafis, they take the stance of two men or one man and two women. So which is a little bit closer to the view of the Hanabila. This particular view that bases itself on this hadith is from the Mufradat of the Madhab. So it's the rare opinions that Imam Ahmed is the only person that called and acted upon this particular hadith in Sahih Bukhari that no, any person that makes the claim like they say I, I am the, for example here in this testimony she's saying I breastfed both of you individually then automatically you know that marriage and you affirm the relationship of them being brothers and sisters this could be like I said previously again that because you غلب جانب التحريم there is two things here is there a sort of like is the testimony there is a question mark regarding it and so you could automatically assume that there's a level of permissibility to attach to it and as a result of that you could affirm the marriage but the the, the concept of muharramat because of the haram being so severe here any form of anything that even proves the haram even slightly such as a very weak testimony is automatically put before the evidences that show permissibility does that make sense so it goes back to the qaida of taghlib janib al-haram ala al-halal putting the prohibition before the permissibility and that is like I said the view of the madhab with regards to this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best and that is the strongest opinion with regards to this a hadith in Sahih Bukhari the last hadith is a hadith regarding al-hadana al-hadana hadana in Islam is uh, child custody laws who gets right over the child and this is a very uh, a problematic arena because you find a number of a hadith and combining between these all, all of these hadith is the reason why the scholars of Islam differ. Every single method has their own arrangements of how child custody laws work. And it's one of those chapters where it's almost, if you're going to try and memorize all four madahib when you're studying things like Bidayat al-Mujtahid from when I remember from being in the bachelor's program, which is like Fiqh al-Khilaf, it's such a headache. Because the, the, the Hanafis have one way of doing it, the Malikis have another way of doing it, the Shafi'is have another way of doing it, the Hanabil have another way of doing it. And so uh, it's a very problematic area. This hadith seems to be the only one that really uh, um, seems to be one of the, one of the hadith that the scholars of Islam somewhere down the, you know, the, 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 the who comes first ladder sort of thing, they have an agreement over. And this hadith is the hadith of Al-Bara ibn Azib. Um, it occurred... And there is a khilaf here as well. Was it again after Fatih Mecca or, and this is a stronger opinion, that it occurred in the seventh year of the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu after Umrah al-Qadha. Umrah al-Qadha. And Umrah al-Qadha was an Umrah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only performed four Umrahs. Four Umrahs. This was the Umrah that he made after Sulh al-Hudaybiyah. So the year that was the Sulh al hudaybiyah which is the Amasid, the sixth year of Hijrah, the seventh year of Hijrah, he goes to Mecca and he performs that Umrah, the Umrah of making up for the previous year, and that is this Umrah. So when he leaves 
And even then, that opinion as well, they differ over when it occurred exactly, when they left. But this is a very interesting story. عن البراء بن عازب رضي الله عنه قال خرج رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يعني من مكة فتبعتهم, فتبعتهم ابنة حمزة تنادي يا عم فتناولها علي فأخذ بيدها وقال لفاطمة دونك ابنة عمك فاحتملتها فاختصم فيها علي وزيد وجعفر فقال علي أنا أحق بها وهي ابنة عمي وقال جعفر ابنة عمي وخالتها تحتي وقال زيد ابنة أخي فقضى بها النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لخالتها وقال الخالة بمنزلة الأم وقال لعلي أنت مني وأنا منك وقال لجعفر أشبهت خلقي وخلقي وقال لزيد أنت أخونا ومولانا And so in this hadith, the hadith of Bara ibn Azib رضي الله تعالى عن The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was on his way out of Mecca He was leaving Mecca when was this exactly a point of discussion amongst the scholars of Islam? The majority of muhaddithin hold that it was right after Umrah al-Qadha, where he performed Umrah right after the following year after Sulh al-Hudaybiyah. He was leaving Mecca, heading out to maybe uh, 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 some other area for a battle, and this daughter of Hamza follows the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, calling out to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Am, Ya Am, the O oh, Uncle, O oh, Uncle, this is a young girl. And so Ali radiallahu ta'ala anha grabs her and took her by the hand and he gave her to his wife, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he says that this is the, the, your, your basically your cousin. And so look after her, look after your, your cousin. After that, a period of time after it, or a little while after it, these three individuals, Ali, Ja'far and Zaid come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam all of them asking for what? All of them asking for custody over this child. And so Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu says and he begins and he says I am the most deserving of it. I am the most deserving of it. Ana ahaqqu biha wa hiya ibnatu ammi because she is uh, uh, the son of my uncle, my cousin. She is because he is the son of Abi Talib and Hamza was his uncle, radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma. And so Ja'far says, yes, but she's also my cousin. She's also my cousin, but I am married to her maternal aunt. So the mother of the, or the wife of Hamza, that was the mother of this daughter, her sister was married to Ja'far. So he says that my wife, is the maternal aunt to this girl. Zaid says that she is Ibnatu Akhi. And here Ibnatu Akhi is a very um, interesting term. What does it actually refer to? There's a number of opinions here, but in essence it refers to the fact that uh, Hamza radiallahu uh, ta'ala an, um, it refers to the freeing, refreeing of Zaid, it refers to the freeing of the slave, uh, Zaid while she was a slave. How exactly that happened is a point of differing amongst the scholars of Islam. And others say that no, it refers to the Mu'akha, which is the brotherhood that occurred in Medina and that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam paired between Zaid ibn Haritha and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. And so Zaid basically comes along and he says, that I am the most deserving because he is my brother as a result of this relationship. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam qadha biha li khalatiha. He says, I'm going to give her, and uh, he, this is a decree from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm going to give her to her auntie, her maternal aunt, which happens to be the wife of Ja'far. And so she goes to Ja'far and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, al khalatu bi manzilat al umm That your maternal aunt is of the status of your mother. And, and this is a very important part of the hadith and we're going to look at it inshallah ta'ala in a little bit more detail. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa turns to his companions and he praises each and every single one of them, which that which they are deserving of. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says to Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, anta minni wa ana mink. I am from you and you are from me. And this is because of all of the great mawaqif 
the great stances and the merits of Ali radiallahu ta'ala an, in that which he enjoyed for the sake of the da'wah that the Prophet sallallahu had bore. And so the Prophet sallallahu gave him the status of you're from me and I am from you. Anything that is harmful for you or anything that's bad that's said about you or harm to you is the same to me and the good as well. And the Prophet sallallahu says to his cousin Ja'far, ashbahta khalqi wa khuluqi, that you are a resem- or your resemblance of my character and my looks as well. And so this is an immense praise of his cousin Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu ta'ala an. And he says to Zayd, anta akhuna wa maulana, that you are our brother and our freed slave. That uh, maulana here, it can refer to both the, the, the person that freed and also the individual that was freed. So the ones that the slave master and both the slave, after they are emancipated, after the slave is emancipated, emancipated is referred to as a maula. A mawla. And so the Prophet ﷺ praised him with that as well. This hadith, in essence, is uh, uh, the, the, probably the one hadith that comes in Bukhari and Muslim regarding this topic of al hadana And we take away that the Prophet ﷺ gave a preference to the maternal aunt. The maternal aunt. The scholars of Islam differ, like I said to you, in a great deal with regards to uh, who takes precedence with regards to Al-Hadana And uh, there are aspects of it that are pretty much agreed upon Such as for example That with regards to a daughter With regards to a young girl That the preference is given to the mother And then after that her aunt Or after that her, her, her grandmother Her mother's mother And then after that her aunt and so on So that she is raised by a woman Is preferred in the Sharia And this hadith is an indication of that and al khala bi manzilatil um that the maternal aunt takes the status of the mother because she, the girls need to be raised in a manner that is tender and soft and gentle and that the, that would predominantly happen in the house of a woman rather than the man uh, the, the, the other as well, the other three hadith, and this is why this chapter is a little bit more complicated because the hadith of Kitab al Havana, it's about com- how do you make jam of these nusus, how do you combine between these evidences. And so there are aspects that the scholars of Islam agree on, and there are aspects that they don't really ha- see eye to eye because of. These are hadith you can view, you can combine them in different ways And as a result of that, the different scholars viewed them or combined them in different manners And so for example, from the things that are agreed upon as well is As a result of this hadith That at-takhir, at-takhir Which is when the child reaches a point of a tamiz Which is like at the age of seven and the like That he gets the option to choose which parent he wants to be with And so this hadith teaches us that that this is specific to what gender? The girls. Why the, boss, the, the opposite. The, the mother, the, the, the girl would have to remain with the mother because that is the most suitable environment to her. So the boy is the one that gets to choose and that is why the hadith comes with that the takhir was regarding the boy and the boy chose to be with his father eventually and the Prophet Sallam allowed uh, the man to take it. Even the hadith, for example, that come regarding such as um, the other hadith Anti bihi ma lam tankahi that you are a more deserving of the havana the, the, to have custody of this child as long as you do not remarry and this is actually a very interesting topic as well because it's almost like you have two people that were married they then divorce then the child remains with his mother the mother gets remarried and there's other children that are going to come and there's going to be a little bit of Issues between how do the two children live together And it's almost like because of that The children are shifted off to the father And that happens with all of these relationships And this is a very interesting hadith in that perspective And so for example Does this apply to daughters in this hadith as well In light of what we mentioned regarding Al-Khala to be manzilat al-um That the Prophet Sallallahu gave a preference to uh, uh, um, The woman raising the daughter As per the hadith that we covered And so all of that Need to be considered with regards to uh, al hadana in general And uh, the scholars of Islam uh, Their aqwal, like I said, they're all over the place With regards to how you structure uh, this matter And so uh, f- the, pretty much there are aspects of it That the scholars of Islam agree upon And there are aspects that they differ upon This hadith, Al-Khalat ibn Zilat al-Umm Is just one of those hadith that The aspects that relate to it that are clear are, 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 are preferred So for example, if there is no mother and father 
and there is a maternal aunt as well as you know there's a bunch of uncles and this individual that is requiring of child custody is a, a daughter a girl that she goes to the aunt and not to her uncles for example that is agreed upon as for the different aspects of the hadith uh, or who comes first with regards to that it's a point of differing and so even for example who gets the first pick as well who gets the first right so so for example the um, hanafi put the mother before the father the hanabi put the father before the mother with the exception of obviously if it's a daughter and all of these differences appear the the malikis from the get-go they say no not even the mother and the father, if there's a divorce, do you give presents to them. They say, تُقَدَّمُ الْجَدَّةُ عَلَى الْأُمْ That the mother's mother is given presents even over the, 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 the mother. And uh, the Shafi'i as well, uh, um, they give preference, preference to any mother. Could be her mother, her grandmother uh, from her maternal, the mother's side, or the grandmother from the father's side. Whichever mother is, we would give give it to her instead of it going to a father, so that they can get, have that rahma in in the way she's nurtured and and she's raised. Um, in general, that which is ma'mul biha yawm when it comes to like mahakim uh, uh, shari and so on, is that all of these opinions in reality uh, uh, they stem around one thing, which is that tuqaddam al That is agreed upon. That relatives, close relatives, are given. A, a preference and as well as what we mentioned regarding looking out for the gender and for the boy looking out for that topic of a takhir which came in the hadith of uh, uh, the hadith that came in Sunnah Abu I believe it's from the narration of Aisha as well um, that once he reached the age of a tamiz that he's given to he's given the option to choose and that's for the boy more specifically um, and so after that if you can't really pick who it goes to that which is acted upon is almost like uh, uh, all of these different principles that we mentioned so far that you just go towards Qur'an. There's, there's all of these different structuring that you find in the madahib. None of it is really based on actual evidence. It's not really a dhabit. And so they just say you pick a lot. And whoever this lands on, he gets to take custody of the child. And this is also what you find in you know the later works of scholars, Sheikh Nuthaymeen, uh, Ibn Qayyim and Izad al-Ma'ad and elsewhere as well with regards to how this topic uh, works. Um, the last thing that I want to cover and which is really important as well, even though it's not really clear in the hadith because the companions had this himma of actually going out their way to actually looking out for these children to begin with. But what is the ruling of child custody to begin with? Is it recommended? Is it wajib? For a child to find a home that looks after him in the midst of his relatives. That's what child custody is. Is it mandatory that somebody takes him in and raises him? So say you're an uncle, you have a brother, that he, the father passed away and the mother passed away. That responsibility, is it just something that is recommended or is it wajib? Uh, any, any ideas? Do we leave them to be treated as orphans? Or is there a preference to them the, being given child custody, being given to a relative, even if it means ijbar, that it's forced onto them? Nobody? Uh, to the ijma' of Ahl al-Ilm, is if there's a close relative, they're forced to take him in. And that it's wajib upon them. And that is what this bab of Havana bases itself on. That a child, he has to be taken in, except if there's just no, there's no way of actually taking his child in for whatever reason that exists. But if the individual or close relatives have, has the ability, then the, the consensus of the Muslim ummah is that they have to do so. And this is something that is mandatory upon them. In this hadith, obviously, you find the Sahaba and how they rush towards maintaining these rights of kinship. Because Sunnah al-Rahim, and this is a form of it, this is a format of where it becomes wajib, is in essence what this topic revolves around. You have a relationship to this child. This child no longer has a parent that can look after him. That responsibility falls on your shoulder. You can't just neglect him. And all of this, in all of these things that we've seen, we've seen time and time again, the rahmah of al-Islam, whether it's towards the children, the two spouses, and the importance of family by way of all of these hadith that we've seen. And this hadith is no different. That the Sahaba, it was well deeply rooted in them, the importance of the ties of kinship, because it was the norm of that time. And so when this child came along and they didn't have anybody to raise them, it automatically, or three of them rushed to try and take them in. And so the obligation is there, even though the hadith itself does not show it. 
والصف هير إن شاء الله تعالى هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك